Now we're going to move on to chapter 16, which covers the reproductive system. This is a very long chapter, which covers a lot of material. So I will be breaking this down into two recordings. Make sure that you go back and listen to both. As with the previous chapters, you will have a list of objectives. You want to listen to both recordings for this chapter. Go back and read this chapter out of your textbook, and then come back and answer these questions to make sure you have fully understood the material. Alright, let's jump into the reproductive system. The major function here is to produce offspring. You have gonads. Those are the primary sex organs. So for males, you'll have testes. For females, you'll have ovaries. The gametes are the sex cells produced by those gonads. So for males, you'll have sperm. For female, you have the ova or egg. We're going to start with males and then lead into females. So for the male reproductive system, you have testes. Endocrine or hormone-wise, they release testosterone. Exocrine-wise, they release sperm. Now the accessory reproductive structures are the ducts and glands. The ducts are the epididymis, ductus deferens, also called the vas deferens, and the urethra. The glands are the seminal vesicles, the prostate gland, and the bulbo-urethral gland. In the testes, you have the tunica albuginea, which is a fibrous connective tissue capsule which surrounds each testy and extends into the testy and divides it into lobules. In these lobules, you'll find the seminiferous tubules. This is where sperm is made, and they're surrounded by interstitial cells that produce testosterone. Then the epididymis surrounds the testes, and this is where the seminiferous tubules will empty the sperm. The epididymis, again, surrounds the testes. This is where the sperm is emptied from the seminiferous tubules. This is a temporary storage site for sperm. This is where the sperm will mature and learn to swim. During sexual stimulation, that causes the walls to contract and propel the sperm to the ductus deferens, which is the vas deferens. Now, that is where peristalsis will propel the sperm from the storage area of the epididymis, and then it travels up and around and empties into the ejaculatory duct. A vasectomy is where they cut the vas deferens. Now they typically will, I mean there's several different ways, they always cut it, um, but sometimes they'll cut it, tie it in knots, and cauterize it, or sometimes they'll just cut it, cauterize it, maybe cut out a larger segment. Now the fallacy or the misnomer here is that people think that once men have had vasectomies that they no longer ejaculate. That's not the case. Okay, what you ejaculate is sperm and semen. Semen's the fluid. None of that changes. So, well, no, the semen changes. So you still ejaculate semen. You don't ejaculate sperm because basically the sperm's cut off. You're still making sperm, but when it goes to leave the epididymis, the bridge is out. <laughs> That's what you did by a vasectomy. You took out the bridge. So now the body will just reabsorb those sperm. So it works out really good. Now, the vasectomy is a very easy procedure. It's typically low cost and it has the best repercussions for you know the individuals. Whereas if you and you're gonna have a vasectomy because you don't want any more children or you don't want children, period. Now, if you do this with a woman, there are major problems there and we'll talk about you know you can get your tubes tied or you can have a hysterectomy these are very expensive very invasive not nearly as easy as the vasectomies alright here you can see the testy and again it's been sectioned into these lobules and inside those lobules are the seminiferous tubules they make the sperm and then they transfer it to this epididymis where it is stored then it travels up this vas deferens and out into the ejaculatory duct now the ejaculatory duct simply passes through the prostate to merge with the urethra which will transport the sperm and urine out of the body now the urethra is broken down into the prostatic membranous and spongy urethra based on where it is it's all still the same urethra it's just what it's going through at that time during ejaculation the internal urethral sphincter constricts and that prevents urine and sperm from mixing because remember urine's acidic we don't want it to eat the sperm 
All right, in this picture, you can see a little bit of everything. So we're going to start by looking at the testy. And you can follow my cursor. Surrounding the testy where you're making sperm is the epididymis where we will store it. Then during ejaculation, it's going to travel up this vas deferens, which is going to come around to the ejaculatory duct, where we're going to start adding the semen secretions. Then it heads on out the urethra. This is simply a different version of what we just showed you. You can kind of see that prostatic urethra, the membranous urethra, the spongy urethra. Again, it's the same urethra. It's just where it's going through at the time. All right, let's talk about these accessory glands that make up semen. First is a seminal vesicle. This is found at the base of the bladder. It makes up 60% of semen, and it nourishes sperm. It's a thick, yellowish secretion with fructose, vitamin C, and prostaglandins. Remember, your prostaglandins are hormones. Fructose is a sugar. Well, what do we use sugar for in the body? We use sugar to make ATP or energy, and that's exactly what this is going to be used for. All right, when the sperm enters the vaginal canal, it's got to swim up the vagina, through the cervix, through the uterus, out the fallopian tubes, to the egg. That is a lot of swimming. And then you're going to learn later that it sits out there for like six hours outside the egg. Here, there's no way it's going to have enough energy or ATP. So we pack it full of energy, pack it full of your ATP, and then you ejaculate it. And then when that runs out, you've got fructose in the semen that the sperm can then use with its mitochondria to make more ATP so it can get to the egg. Now, this joins with the ductus or vas deferens to make up the ejaculatory duct. Then you have the prostate gland. This produces a milky fluid that will activate the sperm to tell it to start swimming. Finally, you have the bulbourethral gland. This sits right below or inferior to the prostate. This produces a thick, clear mucus that first passes through the urethra to clear any urine and act as a lubricant. So, you know, uh, depends, but typically if you're paying attention what the penis looks like during uh, your ejaculation, right before, and it can be right before or it can be several minutes before, but that clear stuff that comes out first, that's what the bulbourethral gland. Again, that's trying to get out all that all that acidic urine. Now, semen is sperm plus those accessory gland secretions. The fluid nourishes and protects the sperm. It is slightly alkaline at about a 7.5, and that's again to neutralize the acidic environment of the vagina, which is at about a 3.8. Now, it also contains seminal plasmin to inhibit bacteria, and 50 to 130 million sperm per milliliter and two to five million per ejaculation. So lots and lots of sperm. But again, the whole point of reproduction is for you to get pregnant, okay? Or if you're, if you're a guy, your job is to get a girl pregnant. So all these secretions, all these actions are all involved around getting a successful pregnancy. All right, here you can see there is a seminiferous tubules inside the testy. Then they're stored in the epididymis up through the vas deferens to the ejaculatory duct where we start adding the secretions for semen. There's a seminal vesicle. There's your urethra. There's your prostate and that bulbourethral gland. All right, let's talk about your imbalances. You have prostatitis. That's an inflammation of the prostate. It can lead to enlargement and crowding of the urethra. We treat with drugs, microwaves to shrink it, balloons, radiation to shrink it. Prostate cancer. That is the second most common cancer in men. It's twice as common in black men than white men. And the risk factors are fatty diet and genetic predisposition. <coughs> Excuse me. We have something called PSA that is prostate specific antigen. This is a tumor marker. Okay, this allows us to test your blood to kind of get an idea. Now it is not a hundred percent. Okay, we like anything below a 2.5. Anything higher than that is bad. That means you got prostate cancer. But again, just because you're below it doesn't mean you don't. It's just a really good indicator for us. Now, Here's the problem with an inflamed prostate, and this is 
because nobody knows they just wake up and go, oh, hey, I have prostate cancer today. Now, what happens is when the prostate swells, it actually pinches off that urethra. So go back and look at some of the previous pictures. Now, what happens is men go to the bathroom, and they've got to pee, they got to pee, and they go to pee, and they get these, like, spurts of pee. Real peeps. And what's happening is... Um, or they can hardly pee at all. It just trickles out because that urethra is pinch. So they go to the doctor, they run tests, and they find out, ooh, prostate cancer. Now, if you're having your yearly physicals where they check your prostate and they do a finger in the anal cavity so they can feel if the prostate is enlarged or not. Now, I know, men, that does not sound fun. I get it. It doesn't. I, I, I'm with you. But unfortunately, your other, the repercussions of not getting it done suck way worse. All right, so let's talk about this for a second. If we find your prostate cancer quickly, there are so many better options for treatment versus finding it out too late. Now, if we find it out too late, we're not going to be able to use radiation, microwave, no, it's going to be too big. So we're just going to have to go in with old-fashioned surgery and remove it. Now, when we remove it, we have to cut through all the nerves to get through it, which means you'll never have another erection ever again. The nerves have been severed. Now, it also almost always grows into the bladder, so we're also going to have to take part of your bladder from you. Now, here's your other option. If you're getting your yearly physicals and you catch it in time, maybe, best case scenario, we can use a radiation or something to drugs to shrink it. But if we do have to have surgery, if we've caught it where it's small enough, we can use something called the Da Vinci machine. This is a robotic machine. And because it's a robot actually doing the surgery, now there's a doctor controlling the robot. So it's not completely robotic. But because the arms are the robot, you don't have to cut the nerves, which means that you will save the erection. You'll still be able to have an erection all on your own without any complications. And, and I know that's a huge deal for men. I get that. But you've got to get your prostate checked if you want that option. And that window closes very quickly. As soon as the prostate gets to a specific size, that option's off the table. You'll have to do the old-fashioned surgery. You'll cut the nerves. You'll lose part of your bladder and lose the erection. So you definitely want to, you know, get that checked, guys. Now, infertility could be caused by an obstruction in the ducts, uh, a hormone imbalance, or environment. Men that are exposed to estrogens, chronic pesticides, meaning a daily exposure, alcohol, um, drugs like marijuana, cocaine, these can all alter sperm. Now, just because I said alter doesn't mean kill. It depends on what it is. Some of them will kill the actual sperm, and you'll end up with, you know, anything less than 20 million sperm per milliliter is considered infertile. However, some of them can just modify or mutate the sperm. Those are almost, they're almost worse, because at least with a low sperm count, you're, odds are you're not getting pregnant or you're not getting someone pregnant. But if you have mutated sperm, odds are you're probably still going to get someone pregnant and then they're going to have uh, a child with all these mutations which end up with multiple birth defects. Scrotum. Scrotum is the hair covered sac. It's divided and it contains the testes. The purpose of it is to allow the testes to hang away from the body to maintain a temperature of three degrees less than body temperature. Now the reason for that is so that you don't cook the sperm. That's why if you're having fertility problems, one of the things they'll ask is if the men wears tidy whities or boxers. Tidy whities keep the testicles close to the body and they end up cooking the sperm versus the boxers allow them to hang loose and cool off away from the body. The penis, you have the shaft, the glands penis, and the foreskin. Tissues here are the corpora and they will fill with blood and become rigid. Now a foreskin is extra skin. Now it's there to allow the penis to elongate. Now all men have extra foreskin and they do circumcisions where they remove that extra foreskin. Now that's a good idea because all that extra foreskin can cause lesions, extra bacteria that leads to women's cervical cancer, 
and, and it's really hard for a young male to keep all that extra foreskin clean because you just don't know how to do it. There's lots of extra folds, and I mean, it gets nasty quick. And can form something called schmegma, which is uh, dead epithelial skin and bacteria and infection. All right, let's jump into meiosis. All right, this is a nuclear division leading to the formation of gametes. You have two successive, successive cell divisions, which you can see on the right. Spermatogenesis is the production of sperm. You end up with four haploid sperm, which mean, haploid means half. Okay, humans or adults have 46 chromosomes in their cells. Sperm are haploid, so they have half, they have 23 chromosomes. Now, the purpose of that is that you take a 23 chromosome sperm and a 23 chromosome egg, you put them together, and you get the 46 chromosome human. Now, with oogenesis, you end up with one haploid egg and three polar bodies, which we will discuss later. So, with spermatogenesis, again, this is the making of sperm. Millions are made each day starting at puberty. That's important because that's not the same for women. We start as a fetus, so make sure you're telling the differences. Now, the spermatogonia is the stem cell in the seminiferous tubules that will make the sperm. All right, you have the mitotic divisions that produce stem cells until puberty. Then you have FSH, which is follicle stimulating hormone, at puberty causes two cells to be produced. Type A will stay in the tubules to maintain stem cell population. Type B gets pushed forward to become the primary spermatocyte. Then the primary spermatocyte undergoes meiosis and generates four haploid gametes. All right, if we look in this picture toward the top of the illustration, again, you can follow the cursor, here are the spermatogonium or stem cell. These are going to go through mitosis, making exact copies of themselves over and over and over of them. Then, at puberty, one of these is going to get pushed forward and become a primary spermatocyte. The rest will keep going through mitosis to make copies so that you'll have another one to keep pushing forward. This primary spermatocyte undergoes meiosis 1, the first division, and you get secondary spermatocytes. They undergo another division, and you get four haploid sperm, which we call spermatids, which are these rounded circles. Now, these circles don't swim, so we're going to have to go through spermiogenesis, which is a physical transformation into the swimming sperm. So, let's talk about spermiogenesis. Here you've got the gametes from meiosis undergo spermiogenesis. Remember, at the end of spermatogenesis, we had four haploid spermatids, those little circles. Okay, that's not going to swim to the egg, so we got to do a physical transformation. We get rid of any excess cytoplasm, and we compact it into a head, a mid, and tail regions. Now, the formation of these immature sperm takes about 64 to 72 days. And this process can be altered by antibiotics, alcohol, tobacco, pesticides. And again, you'll end up with these um, mutated sperm, which then will cause birth defects. All right, so here you can see going from those haploid spermatids, going through spermiogenesis, and finally ending up with the swimming sperm with the head, the midpiece, and the tail. Now, the head contains the DNA. That's the important part. Everything else is just helping get that DNA to the egg. So, outside the head is an acrosome, and it's kind of like a helmet. And underneath it are enzymes that will help break into the egg. The midpiece has mitochondria. We're going to use the mitochondria with the fructose in the semen to make ATP. And then the tail is a flagella to help swim. Testosterone, probably one of the most important male hormones. This is produced by the interstitial cells in the testes. The interstitial cells get activated by LH, luteinizing hormone, starting at puberty.
Now, testosterone is responsible for the growth spurts at puberty, reproductive organ maturation, and spermatogenesis making a sperm, your sex drive, and all your secondary sex characteristics like deep voice, increased hair growth, muscle growth, thickening of bones. Okay, let's move on to the girls, the female reproductive system. Here you've got ovaries. These are held in place by ligaments. Endocrine or hormone wise, we're going to have estrogen and progesterone. Exocrine, we're going to have ova or an eggs. Now, you also have fallopian tubes, which are also called uterine horns or oviducts. Same thing. Then a uterus and a vagina. All right, if we look at our illustration, again, you want to start at the bottom this time. And you can see that is the entrance for the vagina. Now follow the cursor up, then you have the cervix, which is the entrance to the uterus. Then that branches into those fallopian tubes or oviducts or uterine horns. And then at the end is the actual ovary. Now inside the ovaries you have follicles. Follicles are sac-like and they contain the immature egg called the oocyte. So the follicle is just the sac, not the egg. Now you have layers of follicle cells that produce estrogen. You have the antrum, which is the fluid-filled central region which forms as the egg develops. The graphene follicle is the mature follicle that will ovulate. This has an antrum and the egg is ready for release, which we call ovulation. Once the graphene follicle has ovulated or spit out the egg, then it degrades and turns into the corpus luteum. Then the corpus luteum will maintain until the end of your cycle. Again, ovulation is the process of releasing that egg. Alright, here's a cross section through an ovary. If you follow the cursor, we start off with our primordial follicles. Those develop into primary, secondary follicles. And then finally the graphene follicle, which is the mature follicle that will release the egg. That's ovulation. Then that graphene follicle starts to turn yellow, degrade, and become the corpus luteum, which will then start secreting progesterone for us. All right, so let's talk about the duct system. You've got the fallopian tubes, again, also called uterine horns or oviducts. At the end of them, you have fimbriae, which are these projections that partially surround the ovary. To me, they kind of look like a catcher's mitt, and that's what they do. They catch the received or ovulated oocyte. Now, the site of fertilization is those fallopian tubes. Then the fallopian tubes deliver the egg via peristalsis to the uterus. The uterus receives, retains, and nourishes the egg. And of course, the cervix is then the outlet to the vagina. All right, let's talk about the uterus, the walls. You have the endometrium, which is a mucosa inner layer that the embryo is going to burrow into. This is also the layer that is sloughed off during menstruation if you're not pregnant. The myometrium is the middle smooth muscle layer. This is what contracts with labor. The parametrium is the outer serous layer, which is part of that visceral peritoneum. All right, the vagina, also the birth canal, runs from the cervix to the outside. This is our organ of copulation. The hymen is a fold of mucosa at the distal end. This is what ruptures when you have intercourse for the first time. All right, so again, you can go back and look. You see, you start off with the bottom, you've got the vagina. The vagina then leads into the cervix, and from the cervix you're into the uterus, and then into the fallopian tubes, and then you can see the fimbria, that little catcher's mitt that's going to catch the released egg from the ovaries. Alright, this is what a real uh, repro female reproductive system looks like. You can see the fimbria at the ends of the fallopian tubes, the ovary, the uterus, and the cervix. All right, the external genitalia, you've got the uh, vulva, you have the mons pubis, that's that fatty area that overlies the pubic symphysis that um, gains hair during puberty. The labia, you have the labia majora and minora, these are the outer skin folds. Then, <clears throat> 
once you read the in, reach the inside, you've got the clitoris at the top. That's the erectile tissue, which swells with blood. Then below that, you have the urethral opening and the vaginal opening. Now, the vestibular glands produce mucus, and those will flank either side of the vaginal opening, and those are going to be for lubrication. All right, homeostatic imbalance, ectopic pregnancy. This is where the fertilized ovum or egg develops in the peritoneal cavity or the fallopian tubes instead of the uterus, which can happen. Now, PID, pelvic inflammatory disease, is where bacteria or sexually transmitted microorganisms travel to the peritoneal cavity and cause inflammation. That can cause scarring of the fallopian tubes, leading to infertility. All right, in the upper left-hand picture, you can see an ectopic in this in this particular picture is a tubular pregnancy, and you can see where the uterus is in the ovary. Uh, that will have to be removed. You, you cannot sustain a tubular pregnancy. Your body's not set up that way. It has to be maintained in the uterus. And here to the bottom right you can see the PID, the pelvic inflammatory disease, where this woman had to have a full hysterectomy. You can see it's obviously eaten up the ovaries and fallopian tubes. Cervical cancer. Cervical cancer is common between the ages of 30 and 50. You do a pap smear. This is a test that detects cancer cells on the cervix. Inflammation, STDs, multiple pregnancies, or HPV, human papillomavirus, all increase the risk of cervical cancer. Now, I want to take the time to talk about HPV for a couple of minutes. 65% of all women unknowingly have HPV. All right. Now, there is... HPV is one of those things. It was kind of like AIDS when it started. You had all these rumors going around and nobody really knew what the heck was going on. And that is a big problem with HPV. This is by far the number one STD. It is spreading like wildfire. And part of the reason was people were not informed. We've known about HPV for a while, but it wasn't studied very well because when it started off, only a few people had it. We didn't see it was a big deal. And now we know it's a huge deal. So, first of all, let's talk about men. Men are the carriers of HPV. They have HPV and 90% of them are asymptomatic, which means they have no signs or symptoms. Heck, they don't even know. I mean, you can go get tested and find out that you have it, but most of them unwillingly or unknowingly pass it on to their female partners because they don't even know they have it because it's asymptomatic. Now, 10% will actually um, get penile cancer from it. But again, that's only 10%. So women, we're the ones that get the brunt of this HPV. Now, there are currently 200 strands of HPV. So there's a lot. The ones that we're concerned with are the ones that either cause cervical cancer or genital warts. Now, the good news is if you get the type of HPV that causes warts, then you don't have the one that causes cancer. If you got the strands that cause cancer, then you didn't get the ones that got warts. So, I mean, I guess that's kind of good. Now, you will have... Um, when you have HPV, there are a few strands that are just there temporarily and then your body rids them, but not most. Most are going to cause the problems that we just talked about. Now, we do have a vaccine called Gardasil that protects you against the different strands that cause cervical cancer. It does not protect you from all strands or the strands that cause genital warts. It only protects you against the ones that cause cervical cancer. Now, this is not a required vaccine, but it, it should be. It really should be. I mean, there are problems with vaccines just like every other vaccines. Like when you got measles and mumps, there's those side effects. But to be quite honest, HPV side effect vaccines are way less than the side effects that you got when you gave your kids the diphtheria vaccine. So there's less side effects here. Now what makes the 
vaccines so very important because HPV can go through a condom. You don't actually even have to have sex to get HPV. It can live outside the genitals and you just rub your genitals together. That's There is no protection against HPV. That's it. The only way to protect you is to get the vaccine so that at least you won't get the cervical cancer strands. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't get the other strands, okay? But it gets a lot more technical. When you get into some of the other strands, they're a little bit larger. Some of them don't fit through a condom. Uh, unfortunately, the warts ones do. So it, it really is best to look into those. Now, the vaccine comes in a series of three. They have to be done at appropriate times. You have to get the first vaccine, then two months later, the second, and then so forth. You cannot go get the first vaccine and then wait six months. Nope, you got to start it all over again. All right, here you can see a couple images of the cervical cancer and what it looks like.